Hello everyone and welcome to Cine 103 History of Motion Pictures from the beginning to 1945 and we are up to class 10 and our topic for the day is horror and we are going to be mostly in the 1930s but we're going to creep a little bit into the 1940s as well and as with a lot of these separate genres that we're covering in the 1930s this is the first decade of sound or talkies and these films whether they're horror films or musicals or gangster movies are going to really uh, set the standard for the rest of film history. A lot of tropes are going to get set in these uh, in these early years. Um, even even today, 90 years later, a lot of the movies that we see in these separate genres uh, have very, very strong roots going all the way back to this uh, first decade of talkies in the 1930s. And just as we had talked before about Warner Brothers being the studio that was uh, known for its gangster movies and MGM being the studio known for its wonderful musicals. Universal is the horror studio. And just like with gangsters and just like with musicals, other studios made gangster movies, other studios made musicals, other studios made horror movies, but Universal really took it to heart. Uh, they had a pretty good start in the silent era uh, with uh, Phantom of the Opera and uh, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. And uh, so they took that and really ran with it in the early 1930s. Uh, and th those, those two films were starring Lon Chaney. His son, Lon Chaney Jr., tried to uh, have a horror career. He didn't really have the talent that his father did, but I think his name kind of helped him out quite a bit. And so we'll talk about him uh, just a, a little bit with The Wolfman. But anyway, Universal, with its uh, two early Lon Chaney films, had a, uh, a pretty good start, and they decided to take off with it. Uh, and uh, Carl Lemley Jr. in particular, uh, uh, sort of taking over from his father and decided to go in this direction, uh, in part because a lot, of these, um, a, a lot of these stories were in the public domain and it was seen as a way to maybe save a little bit of money. So all of today's films, except for King Kong and Island of Lost Souls, which are both very good movies, uh, are from Universal, the horror studio. And so with all of these films today, we're going to set up uh, horror tropes, just like Westerns have tropes and musicals and all that, uh, classic horror tropes, castles. I think this is Dracula's castle here. And uh, uh, dramatic or violent weather, thunder, lightning, maybe fog, rain, all that kind of stuff. Very, dr very dramatic. Of course, they need the lightning to spark the life into the creature in Frankenstein, but all of these, uh, uh, or most of these films have really great castles. Uh, mad scientists uh, playing God in, in part, uh, creating life in a lab, uh, that, would, that which man should not be doing, right? They're playing God. That is only for, for God to do, not for man to create life. But these mad scientists are, uh, some cases, going to create life, and some cases they're just going to do all sorts of other uh, scientific things, sort of sci science fiction, I guess, in part. Some people actually call Frankenstein uh, one of the very, very first science fiction films uh, because it is a scientist and uh, creating life in a lab and that sort of thing. Uh, we're also going to get women in peril, and we already met a woman in peril uh, actually a couple of times with Nosferatu, which was really just a, a, an early take on Dracula, and also in The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, that wonderful German expressionist film with, uh, with the very cool and strange sets and all that sort of thing. And I always like to remind uh, students that just because these movies are 80 or 90 years old, they don't all have um, sort of old sociological... Uh, um, uh, mores and things like that. Uh, women are in peril in these 
uh, horror movies, but when we switch genres and if we get into film noir or if we get into screwball comedy, then women are very much at the forefront. They're very smart. They're very sharp. They're smarter than the guys are in a lot of cases. Sometimes uh, they get to play the villains, the femme fatales in uh, film noir, and that's a good role, right? Being able to not play the victim, but to be able to play uh, the, um, you know, even the villain is, is, is a good role rather than the helpless, uh, you know, woman being screaming and being carried off or something like that. Uh, it's actually a step up, believe it or not, to be able to play uh, 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 villains. Uh, so in horror, yes, they are in peril, but not all of these old movies uh, are, are like that, right? Not all of these old movies are like that for women. They, they get m better, better roles and, uh, and, um, and, uh, they're more in charge, let's just say. Let's just say they're a little bit more in charge in, in, uh, some of those other genres. But here we are in horror and in, uh, Dracula, 1931, yes, there will be uh, Mina, and she's going to be uh, um, under Dracula's spell, um, and uh, she's she's going to be accosted uh, in the night. This this big face sort of looming above her, um, and that face is Bela Lugosi's. He was Hungarian, so he had a natural accent. He he never really got rid of his accent, um, and it worked as long as he was playing parts that the accent uh, seemed like was part of the character, but it does kind of limit you uh, a little bit. And, you know, we talked about Greta Garbo, uh, and she was a big, silent, uh, romantic star over at MGM, and she was Swedish, and she had an accent, and MGM was very, very careful to make sure that the roles that she played in talkies would address her accent. Um, but that does kind of limit you just a little bit. It limits you. And uh, the same thing with, uh, with Lugosi. He had, that, he had that accent. He really couldn't do other accents or anything like that. You know, there's some people that could do a Hungarian accent or a British accent or Italian or whatever. Uh, but Lugosi was kind of stuck with that. Matter of fact, his English was so poor when he first came to the U.S. And he was a big star in Europe uh, back in the 20s in theater that... Uh, his English was so poor that he had to learn his lines phonetically. He had no idea what the words meant. He just learned how to say, listen to them, the children of the night, what music they make. And he had no idea what some of those, uh, what some of those words were in the very, very early uh, going for him, uh, 29, 30, 31. He eventually learned English and so on. But he had that strong accent all the way through. And after the 1930s and a little bit into the 1940s, his roles weren't so much starring roles. He ended up playing bit characters and things like that. But for Dracula, uh, he is the star. It was a big, big hit. It was based on a stage play, and he had done it on stage, so he knew the part really quite well. And it really made him a big star, one of the biggest stars in Hollywood in the early 1930s based on a novel, 1897, and a stage play. And uh, like I said, uh, uh, Dracula was a big, big hit, setting forth a lot of the tropes that we would get to know. Um, the other big horror star in the 1930s and 40s was Boris Karloff. They have these great names, don't they? Uh, Bela Lugosi, Boris Karloff. Karloff was uh, English. Uh, Boris, I don't know if it sounds like an English name, I guess, uh, uh, kind of. I always think of it as being a Russian name. But anyway, they were both the big stars uh, at Universal and in the movies. Uh, Karloff managed to have a longer career, partly because he was English and uh, didn't have that particular uh, accent, I think. And th there were other personal problems that Lugosi had with, uh, with drugs in particular. So uh, he did Dracula. He did the sequel. Uh, he ended up getting into the Frankenstein, uh, the Frankenstein franchise. He uh, turned uh, a role, an early role down um, in uh, in the franchise, and he sort of regretted that because Frankenstein and Bride Frankenstein were big hits. Um, and he made some movies with with uh, Karloff that are quite interesting. The Black Cat's a real a real interesting film. 
uh, if you get a chance to, to see that. So uh, Dracula, we have um, uh, a, a lot of really great uh, links for you as close as I could as close as I could get. Uh, I started off with the uh, uh, a Universal Horror Tribute because they did so many great movies. Uh, somebody on uh, YouTube has put together a wonderful horror tribute, and then I've got the the trailer for Dracula, um, and then uh, some really nice scenes from the film. Uh, we have his wives awakening from uh, from their coffins uh, under underneath the castle. It kind of looks like I don't know. And uh, there's some uh, really wonderful lighting and and things like that. And for some reason, uh, there's an armadillo, uh, and an armadillo looks like a big giant armored rat. Uh, but they're certainly not native to Hungary or anything like that. So I always kind of get a little bit of a kick out of seeing this this armadillo uh, scampering across uh, the dirt or whatever. Uh, then we're going to get to see uh, Dracula's castle. Uh, very nice uh, set inside. Of course, outside would be a matte painting. Um, and they, they were really artists uh, back then. They could do a matte painting and sometimes they'd put uh, rolling fog going across and things like that and they'd block off some of it so you could actually see the stagecoach on the road down below and, and the matte painting up above. And uh, it really works quite seamlessly. It's quite nice. And uh, Renfield, who's basically a real estate agent, and he is there to uh, sell some property in London to Count Dracula. And um, some wonderful uh, stuff at the beginning. If you want to search around, you can find it. I don't know that I've linked to all of this stuff, but if you watch the film, you'll uh, you'll note that when he arrives at the village at the base of the mountain where Dracula's castle is, the people are very, very superstitious and they keep making the sign of the cross and they have crucifixes and all that sort of thing and and uh, they keep uh, querying him, you're going up there, you're going to the castle, Count Dracula's castle, uh, it's, it's really great. Um, and uh, Renfield is a modern man and he is not the superstitious sort and he is kind of the stand-in for us in the audience and we are not superstitious we believe in science and facts and all that sort of thing and that's one of the things that they do so well in these universal movies is they have somebody who's kind of a stand-in for the audience and they have to be unbelievers Right? They have to be unbelievers, whether it's a, a mummy or an invisible man or, a, or a, a, a cat woman or a wolf man, whatever. There has to be the unbeliever because we know that there can't possibly be such things. And then, in, of course, in the movie, they come in contact and they become believers. And that, so that makes it kind of more real. The, the uh, studio is kind of saying, yes, we know this is outrageous that there could be blood suckers and invisible people and all that kind of stuff but it's really true it's really true and so that's great we walk into the theater uh, thinking we're just in for a fun movie and then we're supposed to walk out of the theater thinking oh my god maybe it really is true okay so it's uh, they actually had a list of things uh, that they were going to include in all of their horror films uh, we had kind of a secret list, but um, in a lot of cases, there would be uh, the, the monster of sorts, Dracula or Frankenstein or the, uh, the mummy or whatever. Um, often there would be romance. So we, we get uh, women in peril and the young men who are supposed to be there to protect uh, the young girl, the pretty young girl, of course. Um, the same guy plays, the same guy actually plays the same part in Dracula and the mummy, uh, likely because he was under contract at Universal and he looked like the, a great young leading man, romantic leading man. He's not the star of the movie, but he's the romantic leading man. And, um, and in both movies, the plots are very similar, as it turns out, the uh, Dracula and the mummy. Um, so that's, you know, that was part of it. There, there would be some romance. Uh, they're thinking... Um, like studios do today, uh, how can we get 
uh, the men to see this movie. Well, we better have some action and stuff like that. And how about the women? Well, women like romance, so let's make sure we put romance in there. And so when they were making uh, uh, horror movies, musicals, uh, or whatever, they made sure that they had a few elements, right? It's almost like a recipe. It's almost like a recipe. We need some elements for the guys, right? The guys want to have the action, maybe pretty girls. So even in musicals, they had lots of pretty young girls not wearing very much because they were going to appear on stage or in swimsuits or something like that. So they know guys like that. Women, oh, well, let's make sure that we have a romantic relationship between a young man and a, and a young girl and so on. And, and a few other things like that. They, they were really trying to make movies for everybody. Um, and and uh, they succeeded, I think, for the most part. Uh, a little of this, a little of that, something for older people, something for younger people, maybe a little bit of comedy for, for kids in some instances, not in horror, but for kids and, and so on. So uh, Dracula um, and vampire movies, they have a lot of mythology. Now, don't worry about all this. Okay, it's a big long list. Don't worry about all this. But they're... Uh, it's almost like going to a buffet. Think about going to a buffet. Okay, do you want some salad? Do you want some bread? How about some soup? Okay, what else would you like? A slice of pizza? What do you want at the buffet? And so here we are, and we are at the vampire buffet. Okay, drinking blood, yeah, we got to have some of that. That's like the main course. We got to have some of that. Uh, making more vampires out of their own blood here. You know, they would bite their wrist and hand their wrist to the victim, and the victim could suck some vampire blood and eventually be turned. Okay, that's cool. How about crucifixes in holy water? Well, maybe we don't, we don't want to do that. There are vampire movies more recently. Uh, today, uh, uh, HBO had uh, a wonderfully R-rated um, uh, vampire series, uh, True Blood. And so R-rated, they could have a little bit more sex and things like that. And maybe let's don't do the whole crucifix thing. Maybe that's a little too superstitious. And, uh, and of course, that would go back to even possibly the Middle Ages uh, with uh, religion being as strong as it was in Europe during that time and holy water. Uh, aside from Catholics today, a lot of people wouldn't be thinking about holy water and things like that. Uh, and that would ward off or even kill uh, vampires. Sometimes it almost acts holy water thrown on a vampire in some movies acts almost like acid. It sort of, it sort of burns and, and, uh, and leaves scars and things like that. Can't be seen in mirrors. Well, that is going to be a key part in Dracula. So that's how, uh, that's how Van Helsing is going to know that Count Dracula is a vampire. And so I've got a link to that scene and that's very key. Uh, garlic for the life of me, I don't know. I guess it's some Middle Ages thing. I'm not really sure about garlic. Uh, bad breath? I don't know. But anyway, garlic is a part of it. And sometimes you could hang cloves of garlic on your door, and that would ward off vampires. A stake in the heart, a wooden stake uh, in the heart would kill a vampire. And in later movies, not in this one, but in later movies, since vampires are hundreds of years old, usually that was the setup for some nice, uh, uh, some nice special effects where we get to see the body sort of uh, wrinkle up and curl up and all the life gets sort of sucked out of it and it would look like a 200 year old would look, right? All of the, all, all of the life and the, and the skin and all that stuff would sort of wither and wither and suck in and all that. So, uh, and they would do that as a sort of a time lapse thing. So uh, a lot of vampire movies uh, in the 50s and 60s would, would do that sort of thing, that sort of rapid aging process uh, after the sunlight killed them or the stake in the heart. Um, and uh, then there's this very interesting, uh, almost old-fashioned uh, that they would have to be invited in before entering. Uh, I, I don't know if that goes to manners or something like that. I guess if you're going to create a monster, you have to give it some weaknesses. And uh, so, you know, with the sunlight and the garlic and that sort of thing, uh, that 
the, uh, they would, uh, it's sort of old world, I guess, very old world and very courtly uh, that, uh, that they can't cross the threshold. Okay, the threshold would be you know, through the front door and they would have, sort of have to be waiting outside. Now, often the vampires, the other, the other part of the vampires that is so fun is that they are seductive and handsome and rich. They're ancient, so they've had a long time to get money together, and usually being invited in is not that much of a problem. They're, they're, they're uh, like I say, very well-mannered, uh, have lots of money, and very seductive. Usually they don't have to overpower, at least they don't have to overpower the women. They are seductive. Now, for other guys and so on, yes, they might have to attack and, and, and bite and, and so on. Later on, uh, like today, more recently, vampires have to almost be like superheroes or super villains uh, with lots of CGI, very, very strong and maybe able to fly and as strong as not a superhero or something like that. In the, in the early movies and in Dracula, uh, they don't give them quite so many superpowers. But uh, today, if you're going to make a horror movie and you want to compete with all of the uh, DC and Marvel movies, then you have to make vampires uh, like supervillains of some sort. Uh, and so not having a special effect power like mind control, well, that's an easy one, right? That doesn't cost any money at all, mind control. So in the 1930s, Dracula, our vampires have... Map uh, mind control, and so does the mummy. The mummy has mind control too, and that's uh, that's that's an easy one, right? Doesn't doesn't cost much uh, to do that. And uh, uh, Dracula turns into a, a bat or a wolf in this film, in the very first film. At, uh, at one point, we see him as the bat, sort of leading the carriage along and flying above the horses. And then in another scene, we don't really see him, but uh, they. Uh, after he departs in a in a big hurry, after being discovered uh, to not have a reflection, uh, they the, the the men run to the window and they see. Look at that! It looks like a big dog, uh, something like that. So, anyway, I, I I think it's just kind of fun. I'm kind of a fan of of uh, uh, horror movies and at least old horror movies and uh, and that sort of thing. And I love to see. Uh, the tropes, really, how some of them are similar, and uh, I don't know that there's any movie that's going to use all of them. And I might have missed, I might have missed one or two. If I if I missed a a, a good vampire trope, uh, let me know. Send me an email or something. Let me know which tropes I I missed. Okay, so uh, you might check out those uh, Dracula uh, clips links that I have for you, and then when you're done with that, uh, come on back to this, that, that's the way I'd be doing it in class in any event. Uh, I would be talking a little bit and setting it all up and then we'd look at some clips from some movies and then we'd go back to the PowerPoint slides. So if you want to try to emulate that, uh, that would be fine. And that means we are now off to The Mummy, uh, 1932, and this is Boris Karloff. Now, I, I'm, I skipped Frankenstein. He was the monster in 1931, and I skipped that because I'm, I'm saving that for last, actually. And we're not even going to do Frankenstein. We're going to do Bride of Frankenstein, which I think is a, a better film. Anyway, uh, there is Boris Karloff in the credits. Sometimes he's just Karloff. And this poor guy, uh, he has all this makeup he has to put on to be Frankenstein's monster, and then all this makeup again he has to put on in order to be the, uh, the, the mummy, Imhotep. And um, he really put up with a lot. It, apparently, he, he just, uh, it was very hot, and he lost lots of weight and everything. It took hours to put him in the, in the makeup for the mummy, and even more hours to put him in the makeup to be the monster. And you'll notice I'm referring to him as Frankenstein's monster. A lot of people um, in, uh, improperly refer to the monster as Frankenstein. Look out, here comes Frankenstein. He'll come and get you. But... That is the creation, or the monster, or the creature. Frankenstein is a doctor, Dr. Frankenstein. In the book, I think he's Victor, and in the movie, he's Henry. 
And so I always like to not get those confused, that, uh, that there's the, the, the monster or the creature, and then there's the doctor. So Karloff is the creature or the monster as uh, Frankenstein and here in The Mummy. He is Imhotep, and he has been uh, sort of buried alive for breaking some very important rules way back uh, 2,500 years ago in ancient Egypt. King Tut's tomb was discovered in 1922 uh, in Egypt, and that really was a big inspiration for the film. Uh, a, little, a, a little side history here. The tomb was discovered by another inspiration for Indiana Jones. And so the, the, the adventurous archaeologist going through and discovering these ancient things and in, uh, in ancient lands. But uh, sadly, most of the people doing the archaeology and the discovery were British. And so they were very happy to take ancient Egyptian artifacts and ancient Greek artifacts straight on back to England. So, yeah, uh, shouldn't laugh really, but uh, they, were, they were pretty good about uh, Imperial Britain and uh, Britain rules the world, and of course they had that, uh, that amazing navy to back up everything, and these other countries like Egypt and the Middle East and, and, uh, and Greece uh, really couldn't put up much of a fight. But uh, sure enough, here come the British discovering all of this wonderful stuff and then grabbing important uh, works of art. So if you want to see some really great Egyptian works of art, you, you go to the British Museum in London. Uh, and there's a lot of this stuff in uh, the Metropolitan Museum in New York City as well. And these countries are trying to get as much of their stuff back as they can. Uh, right now, the, uh, the British have, uh, it's called the Elgin Marbles, it was named after Lord Elgin, and some wonderful marble that was there at, uh, in Greece at the Parthenon. And the Greeks want it back. They want it back. And the British would say, you can't take care of it, and you don't have stable governments, and, and uh, if we give it back to you, it would have a bad... So, so the Greeks built a big museum, and it's uh, got air conditioning, and climate control, temperature control, all that kind of stuff. And the British are still dragging their feet about uh, giving back the Elgin marbles. So anyway... Uh, a little side history there with the, with, with the British in the Middle East and, and all of that. Luckily, luckily, it's not, for once, it's not us in America. Uh, bad behavior. Anyway, um, so in the 1920s, and we've talked about the Roaring Twenties and all that uh, crazy stuff, uh, um, uh, sitting on flagpoles and cramming people into telephone booths and things like that, and, uh, and uh, speakeasies and prohibition and all that kind of stuff, all that crazy, uh, all that crazy Roaring Twenties stuff. And part of all of that was this new interest in spiritualism and uh, seances, speaking to the dead, speaking to the departed, um, and uh, Egyptology and the mummies and all that kind of stuff. It was really, it was really a big thing. And, and, and uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who, who you'd think was, would be very logical and all that with Sherlock Holmes, he was a big believer in all that photographing fairies, all that strange stuff, uh, was, was a big thing in the 1920s. Um, and uh, uh, Houdini, the magician, um, Harry Houdini, he set about for uh, a big part of his career to debunk all that stuff. He would uh, dress up in uh, co costume and stuff so that nobody knew who he was, and he would go to some seance where they were going to speak to the dead, and somebody promised that they were speaking to his mother or some such thing, and his mother didn't even speak English. Um, and he would stand up and rip off his wig and... <laughs> And uh, you're a fraud, and so on. So um, anyway, little side point there about uh, about Harry Houdini, um, the uh, the famed uh, the famed escape artist, uh, and so on. In the crazy 1920s. Okay, so uh, and we've got some nice scenes, ancient Egypt, and the and the and the mummy, and also um, 
the, 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 there's a young archaeologist, the junior archaeologist in the, in the scene, and the two grown-up, I guess, archaeologists are going to go outside and talk uh, about the discovery that they've made, these ancient scrolls and things like that that need to be translated. And so they're going to leave the young uh, 20 something archaeologist all alone. Of course, uh, he uh, is curious like a cat, and he's going to translate the, uh, the scrolls. And uh, the Imhotep is going to slowly, his eyes are going to open up, and he's going to uh, walk out. And the young man is going to kind of, he's going to laugh hysterically. Okay. And there are at least three of these films where there's going to be hysterical laughter. Uh, Renfield at one point is going to just be in hysterics laughing and laughing and uh, and then here in uh, in The Mummy and I'm trying to remember what the third film is. I'm not, maybe it's uh, The Invisible Man, I don't know. But uh, I love this hysterical laughter. Um, it, kind of, it kind of reminds me of, of The Joker, right? Sort of mad laughter, I guess. Okay, anyway, wonderful film. Check it out. And then that brings us back to H, not back, that brings us to H.G. Wells. Now, this is, this scene here is the time machine. What a beautiful machine it was. But that film was 1960, so we're not going to talk about that one, but it's a really good movie if you want to want to check it out. We're uh, going to be talking about The Invisible Man and The Island of Lost Souls. And those two were by H.G. Wells, Herbert George Wells, who was writing this stuff back in the 1890s. And so now it's the 1930s, and he's sort of getting rediscovered. I don't know if it was in the public domain or some such thing. I think part of it was that Universal in particular, they liked the idea uh, that they wouldn't have to pay for the rights to some of this stuff. So uh, let's talk about The Invisible Man. 1933, directed by James Whale, and he is the director of the two Frankenstein films, so he's a, he's a pretty good director uh, in that regard. And Claude Rains is going to do the voice. Uh, I guess just some stunt double is going to do the, uh, the Invisible Man himself. He's mostly he's covered from head to toe. Uh, and some nicely done special effects where he will take the bandages and so on off of his head, and he will be invisible. And it was a pretty lengthy process. It was a matte process. They had to sort of uh, make where his body would be black uh, and sort of like a, like a reversal thing. So it would be sort of like this, this shadow thing. And then they could put his body over top of it. And they would film him against a black background so that his, uh, uh, the, the rest of him wouldn't, wouldn't uh, be exposed to the light. Anyway, it was pretty complicated. I've got a link to a little bit of how they did it, so you can see a little bit of how they did it. But it really is a special effect. For the most part, we don't really have special effects in The Mummy or in Dracula. Um, they're, they're, they're creatures and all that wonderful kind of stuff, but we don't really have any special effects. This one has special effects, and King Kong has special effects. But the others are just really nice makeup and things like that, but they, for the most part, uh, not what... Uh, people would call special effects. So we get to check out how uh, uh, they did some of that for The Invisible Man, and sometimes just wires, right? Very, very thin wires and things to move uh, bottles and dishes and things like that around. Okay, so a wonderful film, very nicely done, um, and we're going to meet a, uh, a great screamer, and that is Una O'Connor, and there she is with, uh, with uh, uh, the Invisible Man. And boy, her scream, <laughs> it's going to drive you nuts, okay? It's going to drive you nuts if you watch too much of it. She gets to scream in Frankenstein. She gets to scream here um, and do a wonderful Cockney British accent. And she is a character actress uh, we've already met Eric Bloor when we talked about musicals, and he was a character actor, and we are uh, soon to meet Peter Lorre once we get into film noir. And I like to 
uh, point my spotlight at these character actors and actresses. I, I mentioned before, it's like a it's like a good meal. It's like a good recipe. It's like a like a meal that it's really good. It's a good steak. It's a it's a good you know whatever a, a chicken, turkey, something, uh, pork chops. But if you don't season it right. Uh, then you just really lose out, right? You really need seasoning. You need your salt and pepper and oregano and all those wonderful uh, garlic and all that stuff, right? All that seasoning. That's what really makes stuff taste really good is the, is the seasoning. And that's, to me, anyway, what uh, Una and, and Peter and Eric do. They are this, they're, they're the wonderful spices and seasonings, and they really spice up the film. Next up is Island of Lost Souls, 1932, uh, not a universal film, based on H.G. Wells' Island of Dr. Moreau. And um, yeah, Island of Lost Souls, sure, it's, a, it's an okay uh, switch on the title. And uh, Charles Lawton, who was kind of a legitimate actor, uh, he didn't get stuck playing horror roles for his entire career the way uh, Karloff and Lugosi did. Uh, Claude Rains also got out of that. Claude Rains is in uh, uh, Casablanca and some other stuff. But the, the stars, the two big stars, Lugosi and Karloff, yeah, they, they kind of got pigeonholed or typecast in, uh, in their roles. He, he has a, he's very creepy. Boy, is he creepy in this film. And uh, that is one of the creatures. And the creatures are half man, half animal. Uh, we're not really sure... Uh, he's cutting them without anesthesia, the vasection, things like that. We don't know. They didn't know about DNA back then. Um, I'm not sure. It's I don't know that it's ever really explained in the in the uh, in the novels or anything like that. How he could do that and and get them to stand upright and speak and all that kind of stuff. But you know, it's fantasy, sci-fi. Uh, we'll, we'll just let it go. Um, but. That's what they are. That's what these creatures are, and they're really kind of sad. They're 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 they have their animal instincts, you know, down below, right? You know, they 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 want to uh, um, uh, run on all fours, and they don't like to wear clothes and all that other kind of stuff. And there's a wonderful scene that I've linked to the laws. What is the law? And, and uh, Moreau has this this whip, and the and the 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 sayer of the laws. I think it's the sayer of the laws. Is played by Bella Lugosi under a lot of makeup. You'll hardly recognize him, but he's under a lot of makeup. And uh, not to run on all fours, that is the law. What is the law? Not to eat meat, that is the law. Not to spill blood, so that the, he's teaching them these laws of man. Are we not men, right? Are we not men? Which, of course, is going to get taken in a wonderful direction by Devo. Are we not men? We are Devo. Okay, anyway, uh, band from the 80s, if you want to check out Devo as a side point. Uh, so, like Dr. Frankenstein and the Invisible Man, we have a mad scientist playing God, creating things uh, in a lab that only God should be doing. And so this is uh, the third of our mad scientists playing God, uh, Dr. Frankenstein. I don't know the, the Invisible Man's name. I'm sorry, I'm blanking on that. Uh, but he's a doctor, scientist, and, uh, and then Dr. Moreau. And as another side point, this movie has been remade a couple more times, and they are just so ludicrous and over the top. It's really, uh, it's really bizarre. Uh, Marlon Brando is in one of them, and it's just the, the, the oddest movies. If you want to see a real so bad, it's good movie, uh, check out some of the remakes of Island of Lost Souls. Uh, but this film, um, I've got a nice link to uh, a commentary, and it, this movie was heavily censored, uh, banned in all sorts of countries, because in large part of the Panther Woman. And the panther woman is beautiful. She's not like this; these these ugly creatures, these awful creatures, and so on. The 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 dog man or the pig man, uh, or uh, like that, right? They're 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 half 
animal, and so what animal are they half of? A pig or a, or a dog or something like that. And she is panther. She's very beautiful, and she's not wearing much of any makeup, of course. And Moreau sets her up with a shipwrecked man to the island, and he is, of course, the stand-in for the audience, right? He, he's the, sort of the, the, the new-to-the-island person, and uh, he's, they're going to explain everything to him, just like they're, in essence, explaining everything to us. And uh, Moreau is going to, to uh, bring the panther woman into the room and say, why don't you two young people uh, have a nice little chat and maybe uh, uh, drink some wine? And then Moreau uh, wanders off. He, he, he is sort of setting them up. Now, th this is very creepy, of course, and a lot of people would have a lot of problem with this, uh, uh, speaking of censorship, because she's uh, an animal, or at least half animal, and the idea that a human man would have sexual relations with an animal, okay, or even a half animal. So um, people could read between the lines, they could kind of figure out what was supposed to be going on. She doesn't look in the least bit like an animal. She's, she's exotic looking with, with long, curly, thick black hair and, and, and eyebrows and all that, but she's wearing a, a sarong and, and, uh, and so on, and she looks completely human, but the whole idea that a human man could be tricked into possibly having a romantic relationship with a half-animal really set the censors on edge. And of course, she was a key part of the advertising campaign and, and all of that, too. Okay, so speaking of beautiful... Uh, seductive felines, we have cat people. And this is a publicity photo. We never see her with claws or anything like that. Um, we never see her in any kind of cat makeup or anything. Uh, so it's a very interesting kind of film. In this case, the director is the key person behind it, Val Luton. He did some wonderful stuff, and he was all about style and and um, and creating suspense but uh, not really that much in terms of uh, violence or action there's some there's some but his was all about um, uh, the 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 uh, mood creating this wonderful mood and so there are two scenes that uh, are linked for you one of them is in a pool and the other is uh, stalking that same girl uh, along the streets uh, in a dark city. We assume it's New York. It's hard to tell. And so this uh, girl here, uh, played by Simone Simone, uh, with a French accent, but that sort of works. She's supposed to be um, Middle European of some sort, and she thinks her people have been cursed and... Uh, it's kind of hard to tell. There, there are lots of clues to make us in the audience believe that it's really true. At one point, there's an attack. And uh, then when they come to uh, um, get the bodies and so on, in the mud, we see uh, animal uh, tracks slowly changing to human footprints. And so we are led to believe that it really is true and it's really happening, but she's going to see a psychiatrist and maybe it's all in her mind and so on. And she's going to have a very quick uh, marriage to a nice young man. Again, remember the romance. I, I told you that, you know, romance is a key part of a lot of these horror movies. And uh, she is afraid uh, that uh, she will turn on him and so as far as intimacy and that sort of thing go, she's very, uh, uh, very afraid of, of being too close to him. There was a remake in the 1980s that is pretty good, and they go even a little further with the woman believing that if she has sex, that will set her off and turn her. And so in a couple of scenes, it's very 1980s, um, after, uh, sort of like a Black Widow having after having sex with a young man, she turns and kills. So 
uh, that is uh, Cat People. And they made a sequel, a very strange sequel, because she, she dies in the end. I guess you could put, or does she? Um, but they do a sequel, and we, we have her, uh, her husband. Oh, I'm sorry. I have to back up. Uh, her husband has a co-worker who's a female, and they were supposed to be just platonic friends. But uh, our uh, cat woman is very jealous, and so that's why she um, uh, costs her in a swimming pool, uh, uh, sort of a, um, yeah, costs her at a, at a pool and on the streets and so on. Her, her jealousy, possibly her jealous rage, uh, might be getting the better of her. And uh, also she's got a psychiatrist that is trying to help her get over all this. It's all in your head. And of course we know it's not all in her head. So uh, those are the other uh, the other two parts. I want to fill in a little bit. I want you to see these scenes and enjoy it. Uh, I don't want to give away too much, but I don't want you to be totally lost. Um, you know what? You know who is this woman and why is so? I want to do a little setup for you. Uh, and it, and it's a good movie, and I would recommend watching it. But like I say, it's not the, the not the gore fest that you might get with uh, with uh, the Mummy or Frankenstein or something like that. Okay, part of all of this is The Wolfman. I can't recommend this movie. Really good uh, makeup. Uh, I've linked to a uh, makeup uh, effects scene. But this is Lon Chaney Jr., and he's just not an actor. He's supposed to be the lead, and he uh, meets a young girl, and it's supposed to be romantic and all of that, and he just likes a, looks like a big lug. He does not look like the romantic lead at all. He's, 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 uh, he's more like John Goodman or something like that. He's, he's, he's not exactly a romantic lead, and we don't believe that at all. He's fine as the Wolfman. Uh, later on, he ended up playing Frankenstein's monster, and he was fine at that because Frankenstein's monster doesn't do, lots of, doesn't do a lot of talking. But we, do, we can see that Karloff really did a lot without saying a lot. And so even as Frankenstein's monster, he's He's no Karloff. So anyway, you can check out uh, the uh, the uh, special effects. They made a, a number, two or three of the movies, and so they, somebody on the on YouTube has strung together all the special effects and whatnot. Okay, now we're going to get to the two biggies, in my opinion. So if you're going to track one of these films down to watch, uh, I would go for King Kong or Bride of Frankenstein. To me, those are the two best. Dracula's fun. It's a little easier to find, um, but it's a it's an odd movie. I let me just say one more thing about Dracula. There is no score in the movie, and it seems really odd. Uh, there's no there's no music, right? We don't hear any music, and and it seems kind of quiet. It seems kind of odd. And in the early in the early uh, sound period, they weren't really sure how music should be used. Should there be music that only the audience can hear and the characters in the movie can't hear? Uh, and sometimes you might hear it referred to as diegetic and non-diegetic type music, the kind of music, if it's coming from people in the movie singing or a radio or something, versus that only us in the audience can hear uh, the music. So they weren't really sure studios if they would do that kind of music or not, the non, non-diegetic non music. Uh, sh should we be able to hear music or not? They quickly uh, landed on, yes, it works well, and it really adds a lot to these sort of blank places. And uh, King Kong is one of the very first films to have a an original score. Uh, so uh, it's, it's uh, pretty interesting in that way. Marion C. Cooper, and the big co-star, I guess, is Willis O'Brien. And Willis O'Brien does this stop-motion animation, and I have linked to a wonderful documentary. Now, it's, it's way longer than you're probably going to want to watch. It's like an hour. If you're into it, that's cool. Watch the whole thing. Normally, I would show uh, about a five- or seven-minute uh, part in the middle where they're actually showing how they do stop motion. But the documentary is the one that uh, I have on the DVD, and I was worried that I wasn't going to be able to find a good documentary on 
stop motion for this online version of the class. And lo and behold, I found the whole the whole darn documentary. And um, but it's an hour, and I don't expect uh, everybody to watch uh, a full hour. They talk about how they made uh, Kong and the and the and the. Uh, the, the jungle and all sorts of stuff. It's a full documentary, but one of the chapters um, on the DVD is how they did the stop motion. So that's the part that I would I would have shown. I wouldn't have shown the whole the whole hour in class, but I, but the whole uh, thing is linked. So you've got a link to the whole the whole thing. Oh, the other the other thing is kind of interesting uh, about uh, this film is. There is a Spanish language version in, uh, colorized. Okay, so there's a Spanish language, Spanish and colorized version of the film. So you can watch the whole movie if you want, and, and the colorizing is okay. And it's a good, it's a great movie. It's a great movie, but it's in Spanish. <laughs> now the dialogue isn't all that important. And, uh, you know, poor Anne Darrow, uh, played by Faye Ray, does lots of screaming. And so the screaming is in Spanish and in English. That's a joke. Um, and so if you want to, right, you can, even if you don't speak Spanish, it's, it's not bad. And it's the whole movie. Um, and it's colorized. Now, uh, I'm not all that much of a purist. Um, if we're film noir, I would say, no, no, no. I, I would never have uh, linked to... Uh, uh, something like that. It's all about light and shadow and black and white and all that. Um, or a colorized version of, uh, you know, Caligari or something like that. But um, uh, I'm not all that much of a purist. You know me. I uh, showed some colorized uh, version of Metropolis because uh, I thought it was well done. And they used to hand color movies back then. So um, I'm not all that much of a purist. About that. So, uh, yeah, I linked to the colorized Spanish version of the entire hour and a half movie, uh, and there it is. And then the black and white stuff of Anne getting captured, Kong going on a rampage, uh, Kong fighting a Tyrannosaurus Rex, and another very cool scene um, in, in the film when uh, the, the link to the rampage, Kong is chasing after the men who are trying to rescue Anne, who has been sort of uh, sacrificed to Kong by the natives. Okay, so there's a bunch of story going on there, but the, but the, the natives to the island, uh, to Skull Island, have, have snuck on board the ship and they've captured Anne and they've put her um, uh, sort of on an altar for Kong to come uh, and uh, whatever. And he grabs her and goes off with her and sort of falls for her, sort of a Beauty and the Beast story. And so the men on the ship are uh, trying to track uh, Kong down and Kong goes on a rampage. And as the men are on a tree that has fallen across a... Uh, a, uh, it's not really a canyon, it's sort of a crevasse, I guess. That would be a good one, a cre crevasse. Um, and so they're trying to, you know, go across, and Kong grabs the tree and shakes it, and they all fall down into the crevasse, and that's it. And they don't look like they fall very far, and sometimes there's little bits of laughter and so on uh, for my students. Um, well, in the original version of the film, they all survived. And, they're, and they were um, attacked by awful creatures, spiders, giant spiders, and things like that. And at a, uh, a preview showing, a test showing of the film, the audience uh, was horrified. <laughs> they didn't like that part at all, so they cut it out of the film. And it has been lost. That footage has been lost. It's never been found. They know it exists because there were people there, and there are photographs of it, but unlike uh, Metropolis and a lot of these other movies, the, the lost footage has never been found. Uh, but Peter Jackson was making his uh, version of the film after he did the Lord of the Rings movies, and so he 
is the one that actually funded the 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 um, documentary that you'll see. You'll see him and his people all interviewed for how they made Kong, and they they were sort of uh, uh, refurbishing uh, the original film in part to promote their own film. Right here's the you know here's the restored. I said refurbishing. Here's the restored version of King Kong. And here's a nice hour-long documentary on the making of King Kong and all that. And by the way, we have our uh, version of the film, our CGI version of the film. But Peter Jackson was very faithful to the original story and, and uh, didn't want to change uh, much of anything other than just making it a little bit bigger and CGI and all that kind of, all that kind of stuff. Now, as long as I'm on uh, an uh, editorial rant here, uh, I have not seen uh, the, uh, the the new King Kong movie. They're they're trying to work Kong and Godzilla and so on up. Uh, and as we see here, Kong is supposed to be about 22 or 23 feet big. He's not supposed to be 100 feet big. He's not as big as a building or anything like that. And uh, so I'm not going to see it. I refuse to see it. And um, you know, I, if they've got the rights to it, fine. Let him do that, but it's certainly not going to be a classic the way the original Kong was. And I think Peter Jackson's film are, is really quite good. Uh, if you wanted to watch it for extra credit, that would be fine. Um, but the new Kong, the Kong and Godzilla and all that kind of stuff, uh, no way, no, that's that's awful stuff. Um, and uh, let me see, what else? Um, so in part, uh, you'll notice that uh, uh, Fay Ray is... Uh, on close-ups, she's in a giant uh, ape hand. Okay, they made a big giant ape hand, just the hand, and they and so she can be in that. But then from a wide shot, they make a tiny little. Uh, well, Fay Ray is the actress, and and Anne Darrow is the, uh, the in the movie, and she's animated too. So Kong is 18 inches high. And you'll see that if you watch the doc, if you watch the document, you'll see he's 18 inches high. There's there's a there's an armature that they call it, like a spine that's posable, and then they put uh, padding and uh, foam and fur and all that, right? And and so the whole thing is uh, animated, which means they they do it frame by frame. They they take Kong and they move they move the the doll uh, a fraction of an inch, and then they click off a frame of film and then they move it another fraction of an inch and, and click off another frame of film and when it's run continuously it looks like he's alive and in part uh, they have to animate pterodactyls, uh, giant boa constrictors and a Tyrannosaurus Rex. So there's a lot of animating to do, really a lot. And in some scenes the tiny little Anne in Kong's hand is also animated. So that's very interesting. She's also animated, and at one point he's going to put her uh, uh, up in a tree to keep her safe during his battle with the the dinosaur. And uh, you you can see if you watch it very closely that it goes from the little doll to the actual uh, live Fay Ray up in there too. Uh, so this whole thing is done with. Uh, uh, stop motion animation, that's the key, and then they have to integrate humans into the whole thing, so they're going to build uh, tiny uh, palm trees and ferns and all that kind of stuff, and shoot all the Kong stuff, and then they're going to build full-size jungle for the full-size humans, and then, and then do a rear projection screen so that the, uh, the men are going to react to this pre-shot animated Kong. And if it's confusing, the documentary should help you out. But you can kind of see uh, they're, they're uh, going to project all that stuff on a screen and then they're going to uh, scream at the, the giant Kong that has uh, been shot. Now we've talked about rear screen projection a little bit already. Normally people are driving cars. That's the main use, I think. People are driving cars. And so in order to get good sound and nice lighting and all the whole rest of it, uh, somebody from the studio would go out and shoot uh, traffic that they could project behind the car or beside the car or toward the car, however you wanna, they wanted to do it. 
So that's standard rear screen projection. And that came about around 1930. Uh, poor Harold Lloyd could have used it when he had to be up in that building, but as we know, he found another way around that. Um, and so, but with Kong, they're using it really kind of as a special effect. It's much more than just traffic behind some people driving a car. Uh, but when the men are watching Kong from the distance, they're watching a uh, pre-animated Kong projected on a screen. Okay, maybe too much special effects. Enjoy the movie. It's a ton of fun. But if you're into special effects and all that kind of stuff, there's a big old documentary you can check out as well. And so, um, watch all that stuff, right? Watch all that stuff for the whole movie. I don't know. And then come back. And now, uh, stop motion is not big monsters anymore. As of the 1990s, when Steven Spielberg shot Jurassic Park, CGI has been the main way to shoot giant monsters and things. But stop motion is still used for, um, I, I don't want to call them kids' movies because they're really not kids' movies, but sort of what we think of as animated and what would have been an animated movie, uh, ink and paint, and uh, or 3D CGI animation, like a, like, a, like a Pixar movie. And stop motion is how they... Uh, would do that today. So, uh, The Nightmare Before Christmas, and I've linked to the trailer, I think, for The Nightmare Before Christmas, uh, and some other wonderful movies. They're like PG movies. You probably know some of them. Um, Frank and Weenie by Tim Burton is a ton of fun. Check that one out. Uh, Paranorman, Coraline, Fox Trolls, and so on. And um, Wes Anderson, Fantastic Mr. Fox, and Isle of Dogs. So uh, two, you know, big-time directors, Tim Burton and Wes Anderson, are working in stop motion, but they're not big monsters. They're not big giant uh, apes or dinosaurs or anything like that. They're leaving that to the CGI people. And so uh, we have Frankenstein from 1931, directed by James Whale, uh, based on Mary Shelley's 1818 novel. Mary Shelley was about your age when she wrote it. She was like 19 when she wrote this. And so that's amazing. Way to go, Mary. Uh, she was married to a much more famous person than she was, uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley, one of the famous romantic poets from uh, Britain in uh, you know the turn of the 19th century. And they had uh, a, uh, another friend, uh, George Gordon, Lord Byron, and he was a, uh, also a romantic and poet and all of that. And, and so Byron and Shelley were really famous. They were, I don't know, David Bowie and Mick Jagger or something. They were, they were big, big, big stars back then. Uh, and they were like rock stars. They, they had sex and drugs and... Uh, and uh, parties and all that kind of stuff, all that kind of stuff that wouldn't go over very well 200 years ago, that's for sure. Um, it didn't go over all that well in uh, uh, 40 years ago, um, and it certainly didn't go over very well uh, 200 years ago. Um, and uh, they were all uh, on vacation in, uh, in Switzerland, staying at a a, uh, not a castle exactly, but a chateau on the lake, and it was very stormy uh, that summer, and so they spent a lot of time indoors, and there was lots of stormy weather and thunder and lightning and all that kind of stuff, and at one point they were telling uh, horror stories or ghost stories, and Mary told this one, and they said, well, hey, that's pretty good, Mary, why don't you, why don't you write that up? You know, gee, that's, you know, that's a good story. This, you know, scientist creating life in a lab from dead body parts and so on. So at the tender young age of 18, 19, 20, she did and became quite famous uh, ever since. But um, at the time, um, uh, Byron and Shelley were the, were, the, were, the big, were the big stars and everything. But uh, uh, Mary... Uh, 
uh, Mary, Mary's novel has lived on, and I don't know, uh, well, the romantic poets are still taught in English class, let's, let's put it that way. So uh, there we have Boris Karloff as the monster with the bride, and if you, uh, when you see the opening, uh, there is a, I'm not sure if I link to it or not, but they, they kind of have an opening where we see uh, the, the Byrons and the Shelleys um, all dressed up in their finery from 1818 talking, and they're setting up the second film. Remember, this is the sequel to the original film. This is, this is four years later. There's no streaming. There's no DVD. There's no VHS. If you missed the original movie, I think the studio is a little concerned that you might not be able to follow the story. Uh, there, there are copies of films around, but maybe you could, if you worked at a studio, maybe a uh, museum uh, might have uh, copies of films and things. They were starting, uh, movie films were starting to be treated as, as art um, back then, even in the 1920s. Uh, so people would collect them and all that, but regular, uh, regular people didn't have access to, to old movies and things like that. Um, so the studio, I think they were kind of hedging their bets. Maybe we better fill in the audience as to what happened and, and why the, the monster is as he is and all of that if you, if you missed it uh, four years earlier. So we get to see uh, them all. And the uh, actress that is playing Mary Shelley is the same actress that plays the bride. And there she is. Her name is Elsa Lancaster. Uh, in the credits... It just says the bride and then question mark, but it's uh, it's uh, Elsa there, and there they are, uh, the creature and uh, and the bride. Um, what a wonderful movie! The 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 scene in the lab, it it's like I don't know that it's the very first time, but the the, the lighting, what we call horror lighting or Halloween lighting, that lighting that comes from below and all the shadows run up your face in the wrong direction. It looks so odd because normally the sun and, 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 and lamps and all that stuff are up above us and here now the lighting is coming from below. Uh, and there's lots of uh, tubes and, and, and uh, 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 odd machines and electrical things and sparks and all that kind of stuff going on. It's what a wonderful set and it goes up, it must go up about 50 feet or, or, or more. Uh, a really great big set. Boy, did they build sets back then. And uh, I, I started to mention, I think, uh, back with Dracula, they built the, the, the set for the castle. Beautiful set in, it, in this long staircase and all that. And it's only in the movie for about two minutes. This giant set. And they, and they just, they could do that, right? They built it. They used it for the two or three minutes, and then they go in and uh, and they, they they eat and all that, and Dracula and, and the poor guy pricks his finger on something, and Dracula looks at him. He's <laughs> he sees the blood and all that kind of stuff. So that's a wonderful set, and and all the sets, right? All the sets, the the island of Doctor Moreau. All these sets are just so wonderful. Uh, this one in particular is is fantastic, um, and uh, and up, up on the up on the they call it the roof, but at the top of the castle there, and the uh, the the uh, uh, Igor, I guess, is up there trying to fly some kites because they need electricity. Remember, this is 1818, and that electricity is going to hopefully spark life of some sort uh, with uh, the creature, and they have all sorts of things and electrodes uh, hooked up to him and all of that. Now, it's kind of hard to tell what year it's supposed to be because we see people with pitchforks and torches and fire seems to be lighting a lot of it but they're wearing uh, kind of like ties and coats and the sort of thing that people would, wouldn't have worn in 1818. Uh, I don't think they were wearing lab coats in 1818 and some of these odd generators, there's a Van der Graaff generator and some other really cool stuff that is sparking and doing all sorts of wonderful stuff but they didn't have that back then, in, uh, in 1818, 
we're still a long way away from, you know, internal combustion engines and all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of in this nether world. It's not really 1935. It's not really 1818. It's some Hollywood time, right? It's, it's somewhere in the middle of all that. Um, and it, it, even his jacket, you know, with the lapels and all that, the men didn't wear jackets quite like that in 1818. Um, and the wonderful uh, sort of lightning bolts up the side of her head there. Uh, it's so great. And um, uh, so uh, nobody can use that makeup. Now, here's the, here's the, uh, here's how it works out. Anybody can make a Dracula movie or a Frankenstein and his monster movie because those works are in the public domain. They are, they are uh, so old. But Universal has trademarked the makeup. So you can't have your brides look like that or your monsters with the bolt, the bolt and the neck and the flat head and all that kind of stuff because uh, Universal has a trademark on that makeup. So uh, if you go to uh, Universal uh, uh, around Halloween and all that sort of thing, uh, they alone, they and they alone can have their, their uh, Wolfman look like that and their, their uh, Frankenstein's monster and even, uh, even the Invisible Man's look uh, with those sort of goggles and so on um, is uh, as trademarked by, uh, by Universal. Uh, so we uh, wonderful the the lighting the lighting in particular boy I just love the lighting and and this is a movie that uh, you just don't want to see in color it's perfect in black and white uh, all the light and the shadow and and so on right and even today right even today it looks fantastic it's it's a work of art it really is um, some musicals are great in color I love musicals in color and certainly animated movies and all the whole rest of it. But film noir looks great in black and white, at least it does to me. And horror movies look fantastic in black and white, uh, at least they do to me. And um, so uh, that's the last thing I would, I would ever, if somebody ever colorized it, I certainly wouldn't be linking to it. And I, I, I don't think anybody's colorized it, thank goodness. Okay, so Creating Life in a Lab uh, opens up um, a lot of philosophy um, and we have neo or revisionist Frankenstein type films. Edward Scissorhands with Tim Burton and Johnny Depp. Creating Life in a Lab, Ex Machina. Uh, and Blade Runner, that's Rachel from Blade Runner. Westworld. And today we don't have so much in the uh, way of uh, creating uh, life from dead body parts or anything like that. Uh, if they're dead bodies, they're going to be uh, zombies or something like that. But for the most part, if it's going to be uh, life created in a lab, it would be uh, of a uh, robot, cyborg, replicant, android uh, type. And I'm not really sure if there's a big difference between... I always think of robots as being 100% metal and cyborgs and replicants and so on as, as having uh, sort of a metal... Uh, uh, interior spine or whatever, and then and then skin and all that kind of stuff on the surface. Um, could be wrong, but that's kind of how I think of it. But um, all these uh, replicant cyborg androids of today and uh, reanimated dead bodies, uh, if they kill Frankenstein's monster, are they murderers? Okay, D does he have a soul? Um, and uh, are, are scientists uh, playing God by creating life in labs and things like that? Are these are these uh, uh, replicants? Are they slaves? Uh, if there's a if there's a robot uprising, right? Is that sort of like uh, 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 you know Spartacus, a slave revolt, something like that? So sci-fi and and uh, and fantasy and so on, they love that kind of stuff. They're big on that. You remember reading. Um, maybe 1984 or Animal Farm, right? So they, they, they love allegory. They, they love all that uh, kind of stuff. It uh, works out so well uh, for, um, uh, for sci-fi. And really, all that, especially sci-fi, but also fantasy, it, it's always commenting on the present. It's always commenting on the present, right? And, and, and 
movies are going to reflect the times when they were done. Frankenstein's going to reflect the 1930s, just like Westworld is going to reflect the, the 2020s. Uh, so as a side point, um, we've, uh, we've done Tarzan and uh, Frankenstein's monster, and in the books, they both speak quite well. Um, Tarzan, uh, uh, Lord Greystoke, yeah, yeah, that's it, Lord Greystoke, um, he goes back to his family estate, he goes to Oxford or Cambridge or somewhere, else, somewhere. becomes very well educated and talks and talks and talks. There's a whole series of Tarzan books, I don't know, a dozen or more. Uh, Frankenstein's monster in the book, there's only the one book, um, at one point he, in the, in the forest, he sees a family and he hides out um, kind of what you might think of as the garage, I guess is the next best thing to call it. They're like the garage, not really the attic, but like the garage and, and it's a storage thing next to the, next to the house in, in any event. And he listens in, and he spies on this family, and that's how he learns to, to talk. He, he learns, he, he can't learn by watching television, that's how they do it today, but he learns by listening to the family. I guess at some point when the family leaves, he finds books and steals books and teaches himself to read, or maybe while they're teaching the children to read, he learns to read, and so he is like, Lord Greystoke, he talks and talks and talks and talks in the book. <laughs> um, and, uh, and you know, do, do I have a soul and, uh, and so on, and I didn't ask to be brought into this world and, and all of that. It's wonderful stuff. Um, and the movies, uh, he's just me, Tarzan, you, Jane. And for, the, for Frankenstein, fire, bad, friend, good. Um, and that's really as, uh, as, as far as it goes. And the movies are fantastic too, right? There's, there's not really a right way or a wrong way. Uh, they both work. Um, uh, low uh, verbal ability and high verbal ability, and they both work quite nicely. And I linked to some of the scenes uh, with the blind man and so on because Mel Brooks uh, did Young Frankenstein, 1974, there's Gene Wilder, and Mel is going to parody, very specifically, certain scenes, like the scene in the lab, and the blind man, and a few other scenes, and they're really fun to compare. So if you watch the, the original blind man, and you watch the Young Frankenstein uh, blind man, then you sort of get all the, all the the, the, the references and all of that and the jokes and so on. And Mel Brooks was really a master of the parody, uh, not only uh, with Young Frankenstein, which he's sort of doing Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein, a little bit of Frankenstein, a little bit of Bride of Frankenstein. Um, and uh, Gene Wilder's character is the great-great-great-grandson, and uh, he has mysteriously sent the original... Um, uh, doctor's notations for creating life in a lab, uh, and so somewhere around uh, the 1930s. So they're sort of treating the original as the real thing, <laughs> and he decides he better go to the family, uh, the family castle in Transylvania, and uh, and uh, all of that. Right. Um, so uh, a, a funny movie, hilarious movie done in glorious black and white, so good good for Mel, uh, and they have some of the original lab equipment from uh, Universal that they uh, uh, borrowed for the filming of Young Frankenstein. Hilarious movie. You can watch it for extra credit, not for full credit. He also does a wonderful parody of Westerns, Blazing Saddles, uh, and of Star Wars with Spaceballs, and High Anxiety, is his parody of Alfred Hitchcock movies, uh, in part Vertigo. So <laughs> when you have Vertigo, you have high anxiety, right? You're afraid of heights. So uh, anyway, wonderful stuff. Check out Young Frankenstein. It is hilarious. Uh, one of the all-time funniest movies. And when Halloween rolls around, what a great double feature to do Bride of Frankenstein 
and Young Frankenstein uh, with your friends or family or whatever. Uh, or even now, even now. <laughs> it's, not, it's not Halloween, but that doesn't mean you can't uh, do a double feature and check out these two wonderful movies. Uh, they're all, all these movies are great for the whole family. Uh, you don't have to watch them uh, alone, on your laptop, on your bed. Um, I, I, I bet there must be people in your family that would enjoy uh, some of these movies. And, uh, and especially Young Frankenstein. Um, and I've also linked to uh, Tim Burton, uh, Frank and Weenie, and uh, that is stop motion, and, and, uh, and it's also in black and white, right? It's also in black and white, and uh, it's, his, uh, it's his loving uh, homage to all of these, uh, all of these wonderful old old movies. So uh, you'll, you'll check that out as well. It is a ton of fun. And in the meantime, that's it for me for today. Uh, horror. Uh, we've still got some more great stuff. We, we uh, have a test at some point coming up, test two. Um, and we still have some biggies like The Wizard of Oz and Gone with the Wind and things like that and Citizen Kane. And we also have two more of my favorite genres, screwball comedy, and film noir. Uh, and they are both uh, fantastic. As far as I'm concerned, uh, musicals, horror, screwball comedy, and film noir are really the, the, uh, the heart of this class. And uh, I love these four topics so much. So I hope you do too. So uh, in the meantime, uh, take care, and we'll be back next time.